Okay, hello everyone. My name is Peter Milne. I'm a technology architect at Adform and I'm going to talk to you today about moving from anarchy to sustainability and usability. Essentially moving user-facing applications from their current legacy state into something that is more sustainable. So I'm going to give you some definitions. It's my job in life because I've got gray hair and I'm old to teach you my wisdom. So I'm going to give you some definitions on some things. Then we're going to talk about the problem that we faced at Adform, some of the solutions we've done. And the last thing I'm going to give you is Uncle Pete's advice because I'm old. Uh, by the way, raise your hand if you're older than 38 in the room. Okay, except for a handful of you, I was writing code before you were all born. So let me talk about anarchy. Anarchy always sounds terrible, but it's not really that bad. It's just the absence of a set of rules. So you may be familiar with this uh, television program. If you are, let me tell you that my experience in Silicon Valley is 100% the same as the television program. In fact, a CTO I worked for was exactly like Ehrlich. So all startups begin with a kind of benevolent anarchy. There's no real rules. You just get together and you work hard because you've got this brilliant idea. So anarchy is not bad by itself. It is just a state of uh, affairs. Sustainability. We all know, because we're ecologically conscious, that we want to consume things that can be renewed and something that's things that can go on forever, sustainable. We consume food and we grow food, and it's the, the cycle that goes on and on. When sustainability is applied to business, you want to have a product or a service that is viable indefinitely. So that is the... Um, the way you have a sustainable business. If you're familiar with game theory, business should be a infinite game rather than a finite game. And usability, there's lots of definitions about usability, but essentially people should want to use it. If you ever want to make a very secure system that nobody hacks into, Make it really crap to use, and nobody will want to break into it. So you want to have something that people want to use. When the uh, iPad was being released, or in its beta stages, one of the product managers took a pre-release version of the iPad to Mexico and was given to another, an illiterate six-year-old child. And the child worked out how to use it. So that's usability. On to Adform. So what was our problem? Adform is moving from a company that was started 15 years ago by three guys in a basement hacking code together to serve ads towards worldwide influencers to become a worldwide global uh, um, company. So this journey is very important. In fact, the journey is m more important than the destination. And that's where we're going through right now. But the problem we have is that we have an inconsistent user experience. We have 130 applications, all with different code bases, all with different frameworks, all with different programming languages. Uh, nothing is common, nothing, almost nothing is common and shared. Um, and we have about a thousand APIs, uh, REST APIs, each with their own dialect, each with their own style, and each with their own set of versions. So if you know one of the problems with REST is if as soon as you have two versions of it, you have double the APIs because you've got to deprecate the old ones over a period of time. So if we have three versions, you know you have 3,000 APIs to maintain. All of those are problems. Nevertheless, what we have actually works. It's usable and it makes money. But the experience is a bag of stuff that you have to become an expert in using. So um, this is kind of 
the user experience that we have. And that's what we want to change. Why do we need a good user experience for our user-facing applications? It makes money. We all get paid because the enterprise we work for either makes money or if we're in the public sector, does some good for the community. So it has to be usable and continue to deliver that good. So we've got, here's an example of our user-facing applications. Our, our publisher side of the world is made out of Lego. Our campaign side of the world is made out of a, a bespoke uh, plastic model. Our creative is made out of cardboard that you get out of a book. And our data management platform is made out of Playmobil. They all work. They all look good, but they're very different from each other. The user experience is different. And as you're all technologists, you can see they're made out of different things. That's the problem. Next problem we have is our navigation is a mess. Okay, this is a navigation map of one of the applications, and I won't tell you which one it is. And those are the link traversals. So if you've done any graph theories, um, if you want to get from here to here and you use Dijkstra or A star, you'll know that that's a traversal problem. That's hard for users to learn. And people only use a subset of it. So about a year and a half ago, I took my uh, heart in my hand and went to the founders of the company and went, what do you want to do? We can do business as usual. We got to the crossroad. We can do this and still make money. But the amount of money would be linear. So the, essentially, the, the revenue per head would be linear as it grew. We could add more people to the company and we'd make more money. But there would be no force multiplier. Or we can look at the usability issues and the sustainability issues. So courageously they said we were going to look for a new way of doing things. So what are the goals here in reusability and sustainability? We want a consistent user experience, regardless of which application or which portion of ad form people touch. It is familiar. It is easy to use. Um, we want to have a flexible UI that, en that encompasses things in the future. Things like mobile devices, or Alexa, or Siri, or Hey Google. I'm not sure how we'd actually use that technology, but I don't want to ever limit us to ha not having a, a new UI. One day we might all put contact lenses in and just sort of stare off into the distance and uh, do our, our campaigns that way. The other one is a bit more subtle. Uh, I wanted to have a common set of tools and frameworks and languages that our software developers could use so that when they moved from one business domain to another, they only had to learn the business domain rather than the new uh, CICD or the new programming language or the new uh, fashionable framework for development. So these are, these are really, really nice goals. Uh, I've mentioned them as goals because they haven't realized yet. So I've covered the problem. And I've given you an idea of how big and how wide the problem is. So let's look at the solution. So uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, some colleagues and I came up with this wonderful architecture. So what you see over here is a component diagram which is just in the architecture space. And it shows you the front end pieces and the back end pieces and the access to data and uh, API layers down here. And there is a quiz at the end of my presentation. And you'll all be graded. Your salaries will depend upon how much you retain of this uh, graphic. Just kidding. But the idea was we wanted to build a front end that was a single web page application. Instead of having 100, and 100 and 30 applications that are about 496 individual pages. We wanted one. This means the way we build solutions changes. We build a solution for the user interface similar to the way you build for a graphic user interface. In this case, the graphic user interface environment is the web browser. 
So it changes the way you build things. We want it to have common components, a single sign-on, surprisingly, and reusable things that we eventually called applets. And we wanted to have a declarative navigation system. That means a user navigating from one part of the application to another, which we called workflows. And then on the back end, instead of having a thousand endpoints, and if you add versions into them, 3,000 endpoints, each with their own dialect, each with their own technique of doing things, we wanted to have a single endpoint and a single dialect to talk to that endpoint. So you're all going to say, well, REST is REST. It's marvelous. It does everything. REST is brilliant. But when you get to the scales that we were facing in our application, it's too complex for the user interface, too, comp too costly to maintain, uh, to have the front end developers learn all the different dialects for all the different APIs. We also move from the concept of having uh, features, features that people want. Oh, we need a new XYZ feature. We'll bolt that on the side and we'll put it in here and it'll be fine to uh, requirements based on personas. So personas is a new kind of modern term to describe a UML actor. Someone who uses the system is a persona. So we have personas for people who do to create uh, buyer campaigns and create seller campaigns and do all of those kind of digital marketing th things. What these personas do are kind of requirements. They're kind of scenarios. And these are what we would call UML use cases. So we've moved from this uh, random, let's throw a feature against the wall and see if it sticks, to something a little bit more sensible. So if somebody says, I need a feature in a campaign line item that uh, will get us to win this next deal, we say, OK, which persona is going to use that? Is it a one-off, and therefore should we do it, or does it benefit many people? So we also moved uh, to a bunch of standard technologies to choose. So on the front end, we're using React as the, uh, as the framework for the front end. Now, I know as front end developers, you're quite passionate about which framework you use and how much you like it. And there are several very good frameworks that we could have selected from. But my, uh, my colleague, who is our front end architect, selected React for his own good reasons. And it's a standardized way that we can work. So all of our standard components are now built to be React components, and they all look the same. We've chosen GraphQL as the uh, dialect that goes between client and server, between front end and back end. Single dialect, same pattern, same concept behind it all. Then we've used, we're using OpenID Connect as our um, user identification, so user authentication and authorization mechanism. It's a standard. It's a very robust standard. And we're fitting that into AdForm in the most practical ways that we can. So instead of inventing your own technique, we're using a standard. Rather than writing our own GraphQL servers, we're going to use the Apollo server, which is a Node.js implementation that we get for free. It's quite robust. It sits on top of Express if you're a back-end JavaScript guy or girl. We're also moving from .NET Classic to .NET Core as much as we can. It's a direction. So why would we do this? Why would that be a good idea? This is the hint. We want to run things in containers, which tend to run really nicely on Linux. And we want to uh, orchestrate them using Kubernetes. More to discuss on that a little bit later on. Some of our back-end stuff is moving to Node. Uh, for some good tooling reasons. We've selected RabbitMQ for the pub-sub queuing uh, dialect that uh, processes have between each other. And our APIs, the ones we publish, are open APIs. So right now we're sitting at, at Swagger 2.0. 
uh, going to 3.0 is a decision we haven't made yet and what the impact would be. We've selected a bunch of technologies that are standards based, that are relatively available in the marketplace and they're pretty cool and interesting to deal with. So let's jump into some details, the front end and talk about applets and workflows. The first thing we wanted was a single web page application. So this is like a desktop. A single web page application is like a desktop and the graphic user interface is inside the browser. So here we have, you know, the typical thing on the side, navigation on the side, some subject matter in the center and something interesting over on the side here. Those yellow boxes represent components. So instead of us loading web pages, we load JavaScript files and instantiate the classes to render the things on the page. Single web page application. We also had to introduce the notion of components that were standardized. So we built a bunch of simple components, some composite components that are made out of the simple components. We introduced the notion of an applet. So if you're a React person, you'll know what a high order component is. So um, an applet I'll talk about in a few, a few slides in detail has some more functionality, has some business functionality associated with it. Whereas a composite component is just a way to render data. The best example is a list of campaigns in an applet or just a list control. And then finally, we want to go to the point where we have work, uh, workflows where we bind applets together in a usable scenario. So let me talk about applets for a moment. You already use something like applets. It's not something that AdForms invented. In fact, Microsoft invented them in Windows 2.1 before many of you were at school. They're little single-use applications. They do exactly one thing and they do it very well and you can embed them inside of other things. So when you have a Word document and you have a, a picture in it and some text in it and a uh, spreadsheet in it, that's not all built into Word. That's built into self-aware components that can be used inside something else. So if you're familiar in the old days, there was a thing called object linking and embedding that was later called ActiveX. Is where you could build a component that did some tasks, some had some processing or some visual pieces to it that you could embed inside your work. Okay, similar concept. So what's the scenario that I'm trying to get to here? Let me talk about workflows. When you want to add an e a picture to an email, so you make a gesture, this is an iOS, so you make a gesture in iOS to add a picture. You select the picture, you choose the image, you confirm it, and suddenly it's in the email. The email app does not know anything about pictures. It doesn't even render them. It does know about MIME types and attachments to the email. So what you've gone there from is you've navigated out of this to this, to this, to this, to this, and back. So the behavior of rendering a, an image or listing images to be selected is not a function of your email app. doesn't have to have intimate knowledge about it. It's just, it just uses what's available. So you can see the same thing can apply to a web-based or a UI-based application. So we've gone from applet to applet to applet to applet to do the task. So applets are essentially small problem solvers. In this screen you see on the right hand side you can see three business based applets. applets. There are some others in there as well. They do this. They know how to get their data, they know how to render their data. They're actually very functional on the single thing they do. They're absolutely apathetic of, um, they're ignorant of who calls them, so they don't care who they're called by. They have some context passed to them. And they're apathetic as to what is done with the information. 
So they're completely self-contained. So in this example, I've got a campaign details applet. It will probably do a GraphQL query to obtain that detail. Okay, here's some code that looks like an applet on the right-hand side. Once again, I'm not a React guy. So workflows are a business scenario that stitches applets together to make up something useful. On the previous screen, we saw three uh, applets put together. You could put uh, knowledge in this applet, how to call that one, and that applet, how to call that one. And that would be bad because this would have intimate knowledge about this, so the calling sequence that you would use, and the same there. If you abstract that up to some outer calling system, then the applets remain components and you have something that sits on the top that makes it happen. And we call this a workflow. Think of it as the glue that sticks applets together. Now the green box you could write as code. But what we actually have done is we're going to build workflows as a finite state machine. You remember in probably the second semester of university when we talked about finite state machines, you, you nodded at the lecture and went, oh yeah, I understand that, that's great, and you've never put one into production. Well, all of the user interfaces I've designed in my entire career have finite state machines in them. It saves on your stack and your heap space, regardless of the environment you're running in, and it saves in the, in the web, web world that saves on the link madness that goes on. So back to our scenario that you see at the top there, you can see that we have a state machine diagrammed here where we're going between states. The states represent what the users can see and the transitions represent activity or events stimulated by the user's behavior. And if you're really smart, you can see that you could make this declarative. So you could make some kind of, in this example, a JSON um, declaration that represents the workflow and you could have a single workflow engine pretty simple to code that would execute each one of these when I get this event I'm going to transition to this next thing and we're going to load it so dead easy to do the idea is we take the navigation out of the business logic and put it into something that is reusable make sense there's a question at the end in the quiz on finite state machines. Okay, so that's the front end in its most simplest form. Let me talk about the back end. So essentially in the back end you want to access business entities. You want to display them or create them or mutate them or do something with them. So the first thing we needed was a business entity model, a canonical business or logical business entity model that we could transform to a physical model, in this case a GraphQL schema. So that if we talked about a line item or a campaign, everybody's talking the same language, has the same fields in it, the fields have the same types, the values are all going to be the same. So that was the first step. And this is, this is not an easy task. If you don't start with this, it's hard to reverse engineer it. So there's uh, so, we talk about legacy code. AdForm's been in business for 15 years and there's code still running that's 12 years old. It still works, it still makes money, so we can't just cut it all away and start from scratch. We have to integrate with what's there. So, GraphQL schema, if you're not familiar with GraphQL, the schema definition allows you to define types and the relationships between types, just like a, an entity relationship diagram or a class diagram, depending which mechanism you're using, it allows you to, to define queries on those types, the read model, the mutations on those types, the write model, and subscriptions, subscriptions when something happens to one of these things, somebody might be interested in it. So this is at a conceptual level, how it's implemented. There's all sorts of technology that sits underneath. But that's the concept behind it. It's quite powerful in concept. So when you have an applet living out in browser land, wants to make a call and obtain some information 
from back-end land, it does something like this. So a single, the applet calls a single endpoint, well-known endpoint. In our case, we have a little client that sits inside the browser. It talks and puts a, a GraphQL query to the middleware server. This blue thing represents the internet. That's the low bandwidth part of the communication path. Somewhere down here in the schema server, we might call two or three of our local microservices, either via a REST API or a GraphQL API or anything that exists, compose the results and return them. So you can see from here over, we're going over the high-speed high speed path. That's in the data center. That's where the, um, the speed of light doesn't matter anymore and the network bandwidth is unlimited and we have super fast machines. But this is the slow speed part of the world. This particularly is important if you are building a mobile device and your front end was on mobile and you were going over a 3G or heaven forbid an edge network where you were trying to get some speed out of it. So that's the, the single dialect, the single protocol, the single endpoint. So the schema server is a, an exotic device that is designed to contain a single business entity model, the GraphQL schema, and then communicate to different microservices inside of Adform. And so these are depicted down here. Some of them have a REST API. Some of them have their own magical communication protocol. Still valuable. It's just not standardized. And uh, we build a modular schema so that we can pull them together in one composite schema. Why GraphQL? The schema is really easy to version. You can deprecate fields and things like that quite easily and you can replace them with new ones without having to put something in the path name such as you do with REST. So I mentioned the modular schema. We have probably 2,000 entities in Adform and they're each owned by different uh, expert teams. So the campaigns team own, open, owns a campaign. The audience team owns an audience and what it is, what it does, what it means, what the fields mean inside that entity. So it would be silly to try and build one huge schema <coughs> with 2,000 things in it. So we have a schema module and it has types and queries and mutations and sub subscriptions and resolvers and a connector to something. The connector would be to a database, to an API, to some place where you've stored the entity. We build these modules and we aggregate them together into a single schema in the schema server. And I've got some nice documentation on the right-hand side that tells you how we do it. But the point to remember is we have a schema server that has modular, modular schema components built by the expert teams. And that way we can have a very large schema without having fights every afternoon on who owns which entity. In the middleware side of things, we put all these things together into a bunch of subsystems. So we have a middleware server that sits out here and its job is to peer at inbound requests and to see if you're allowed to do them. So all of the authorization is done there. We peer inside and look for a bearer token or, a, or an auth ticket and we then validate that and see if you're allowed to do anything. We also do some query cost analysis to see if you are querying 100 elephants or three mice, because that's very important to know what to do. Then we pass the request on to other parts of the subsystem. So we have, of course, a schema server that does the entities. We have a configuration registry, and its purpose in life is like the Windows registry. It's where you can store some configuration value based on either a user or as a, as a system-wide thing. And that gives us the flexibility for a user to, I don't know, save the background color of their screen or a, a position, uh, a component on their screen, that kind of a, a problem. And so, um, and we are in the future going to build a state server. So the state server contains the state of a workflow. Imagine you'd been doing a workflow and you got through seven steps of it, you hadn't finished. It'd be nice to come back to that same state and resume the pending workflow. So that's our plan for that in the future. So what I've given you so far is the problem, the solution as we guessed at it, 
what we do in the front end, the technologies we've used, and what we do in the back end and the technologies we've used. I want to talk a little bit about production, DevOps. So the first thing we've implemented is a really nice uh, development pipeline. We use GitHub Enterprise where we store everything. <laughs> where we hope we will always store everything or hope in the future we will store everything. We have a few things in other repositories but that would be the nice place. For a CI CD we use drone. So drone is a nice CI CD tool for particularly for containers and it's delightful. You simply commit something to GitHub and you perhaps put a tag on it and the pipeline will run and it'll run all your unit tests and all of your, your other tests and decide at the end whether it's going to go to production. We use um, Helm as our Kubernetes packet manager. So Helm is a, a set of charts that describe how you're going to deploy your, how you're going to configure Kubernetes to deploy your, comp your um, containers. And we store stuff in Artifactory. This is our private binary repository. This is where we store, you know, NPM packages or NuGet packages or um, Maven style packages. Stuff, stuff that we've made or stuff that we've brought in from the outside of the organization to keep it safe. So let me talk about containers. <clears throat> you know what containers are. Everybody knows today we get an isolation out of it and resource limiting and control and things like that. Why do we bother? In Adform, we used to have, we still have a whole stack of VMs, a whole stack of Windows VMs running on Linux, and in some places, a whole stack of Linux VMs running on Linux, which is a bit sort of... So um, what you get out of containers is you'll probably get a fourfold factor. You'll probably be able to do four times as many things on a physical machine as what you could do with the equivalent number of VMs. If you're not familiar with what Linux has, it has a thing called C groups which allows you to portion off a section of the machine, and that's what containers are. So if we use technologies like .NET Core or Node.js or something that lives in a JVM like Scala or Java, they're really nice to package up and put in a container and run them. So the orchestration side, you can see here we have some uh, instructions that live inside of our, our uh, Helm charts. And we use Kubernetes for the orchestration, so we can define a cluster, Kubernetes cluster, with um, DNS name resolution inside the cluster, and where ports are going to be mapped. And this uh, cluster can sit on n virtual um, um, physical machines, and it takes all of the hard work out of it. So if you want to have um, three to ten replicates of the particular service, you can define that. If you want to have auto scaling, you can define that. If you want to have auto descaling, you can define that as well. So Kubernetes takes the pain out of it from a, an ops point of view. And we've also introduced a bunch of common services. So um, these are often missed. So authorization, of course, we use the OAuth for that and OpenID Connect. But things like logging and monitoring and the gathering of metrics and other stuff that every, every service, every back-end service needs to do and needs to be rendered in some way. So we use things like Grafana for the, for the graphs and we use Prometheus for the metrics. If you're not familiar with Prometheus, take a look at it. It's really nice, easy to implement. We use Elk to, do, uh, to, to allow us to look through our logs and discover problems. So all of these things are now provided by our wonderful DevOps team rather than our development team becoming expert in all of the technologies and writing this stuff for themselves. My idea is to have engineers be engineers rather than somebody who's mowing the lawn or sweeping the path. So we've got a few more minutes and I'm going to give you Uncle Pete's advice. First up, software engineers. I work with probably the best collection of software engineers I've ever worked with in my life. None of them are stupid and none of them are lazy. But they do like to argue and they do have some very favorite technologies and they're very passionate. But as we're a group of software engineers, you know that moment where you're sitting working on a problem quietly, you don't move, you stare off into the space, three hours go by and then you write a little bit of code that is the solution to the problem. And when you see that code running, 
it is the most euphoric moment because you've done something clever. And you don't care if somebody else doesn't see it. So musicians are more creative, uh, sorry, uh, software engineers are more creative than musicians or artists or playwrights or painters. We take thousands of variables and we distill them into a, a solution. And in fact, if somebody interrupts you during those three hours, like your manager goes, I have a quick question, what happens is you have to start over again, right? Yes, I can see you nodding. Uh, the joke, of course, is that arguing with an engineer is like wrestling with a pig. After a while, you realize that the pig likes it. Um, then if you look at our other legends, so DevOps engineers, these people who provide our operations environment are like Scotty on the Enterprise. Captain Kirk says, give me warp factor five, and Scotty delivers it. He says, it can't take it anymore, Captain. It can't take it anymore, Captain, and all those kind of things. But these are the absolute legends. We have a, a small group of uh, impressively talented DevOps engineers that without them, we would be screwed. They have taken our messy, uh, ad hoc, siloed production environment and made it standardized as best that they can. And they give us more and more services that as software engineers we can consume. Okay. Now I've talked about uh, our favorite things and the technologies we love and I'll remind you that we work in the fashion industry, not the IT industry. And every few years, two to five years, there's a new fashion and we, ha we rush to adopt it. What I'm saying about that is if you look at the, the um, textile fashions at the top and then you look at the programming language at the bottom, the ones in blue are the ones that I've had to learn over my career some things that I, I really never wanted to do, um, never wanted to do, never wanted to do. In your career, technology will change and it's frightening. You can say, I'm a .NET guy or I'm a .NET girl. Well, evolve, learn new things. Learn how to use .NET Core, go through whatever that little pain is to switch between the two. Last year, I learned JavaScript for the first time. And I learned Node.js at the same time. I used to think JavaScript was Satan's vomit. And then I had to learn it. So uh, don't be frightened of the change. The next point is that technology is additive. The technology that you learnt uh, 38 years ago, you can still draw on in later life. So let me give you an example in memory. The original memory that we had was mechanical relays. Then there was a mercury ripple tank. And you're all looking at me, what? There was a transducer at the one end of a long mercury tank of mercury, and it would vibrate, and those vibrations would be bits stored in, this, in the wave in the tank. And at the other end, there was a, a transducer. So while it was stored in the mercury, it was a serial uh, memory that was some kind of memory. You're looking at me, what? Then there was magnetic core invented by Dr. Ahn Wang, which is little tiny uh, tors shaped uh, magnets with wires running through them. And that was the first memory that was laid out in a matrix. And then we had discrete flip-flops. Everybody knows what a flip-flop is, right? Okay, good. Then we went to TTL and CMOS dynamic and static RAM that's uh, available. In fact, it's very much what we have today. And then we went to NAND memory. Everybody know what NAND memory is? A floating gate MOSFET transistor, floating gate metal oxide um, field effect transistor. You have them all in your pockets. You have them all in your phones. This is, flat, this is what we call flash memory today, SSDs. And then the stuff that's just coming out is non-volatile DIMMs. So this is actually R memory where you use the resistance or you use a small resistor to represent a bit. And these are not volatile, they sit inside. So you can have um, essentially RAM speeds for, uh, and the persistence of, of uh, SSDs. So it's just coming out, um, Intel make it, it's called Optane. It's profoundly expensive, so you'd have to sell a child and, and uh, that kind of thing to afford it, but it's coming. But it's all additive. And finally, things change. 
Don't expect stuff to be constant. The telephone on the left is what I had in my home when I was a kid. Today, I have a supercomputer in my pocket. And I don't need to have a wire that connects me to things in this massive telephone exchange. That's all done by magic and voodoo, right? So things change. Accept the change, adapt to it, and retrain. The tools you use will change. Who, who uses VS Code today? What did you use 10 years ago? OK, don't answer. <laughs> so you know, I would have said Eclipse. And then if you go back another 10 years, it would be something else, and something else, and something else. And eventually, it would have been VI. And I know there are people in the room who love VI, and it's a religion and that sort of stuff. And I don't denigrate it at all. But it's a very in, unproductive way to write code. So consider that your technology, your tools, and your use cases will change. You're all professionals. Embrace it and become bigger from it. And that's all I have for you. Does anybody have any questions? That's a question here. Ah, that's an excellent question. So the question is, well, you've got this bunch of old stuff, and how do we rewrite it from a product management point of view? So that's a difficult thing, because you've got a huge investment of time and money in what you have that's old, and it still works. So we have introduced a thunk layer. Anybody know what thunk is? It's an interoperability layer. In Windows 64, you can thunk to Windows 32. You're changing the... the uh, the byte width of the integers that are involved and the addresses that are involved. And it means interoperability. So as a first step, we've introduced a thunk layer where you can use the new stuff in the old applications. But eventually you get to a point where the cost of doing that exceeds the cost of rewriting that portion of the functionality in the new thing. So no company in the world ever has enough money to rewrite everything. No company in the world has enough money to rewrite 500 web pages into a new technology for no good reason. So we have to find a gentle migration path. And I'm just a humble architect. So I leave that to talented, wonderful uh, project people like Alona here who are wise and beautiful and intelligent and capable of handling that kind of crap. So that means I don't really care. No, it's not true. And there's another question? Yes? Ah, yes. The question is, uh, so if you had something that componentized like an applet or a workflow, and somebody did some courageous change to it, it could destroy other things. So that is exactly the same problem as if somebody uh, changed the behavior of a function or a class in a library. So it could break a lot of other things. So this is now software engineering. So we decide that we're going to increment. We're going to change something in an applet. We're going to be good software engineers. We're going to document the change, give bump its version to something else. We're going to test it in isolation as a unit test, and we're going to test it in integration. So when you get to a big application that has lots of dependencies, you have to have repeatable usability and integration tests. So there's nothing magical or new about it. It's exactly what you already know how to do. Any other questions? Well, thank you for listening to me. Oh, no, there's one over here. Yes. Yes. Okay, what good does the software do for humanity? So we're an ad tech company, so that's an interesting philosophical question which we could debate forever. But number one, it employs nearly 900 people around the world. Uh, so that's the first thing it does for humanity. And a lot of them live here in Lithuania, some of them in Belarus. Some of them in Poland, some of them in Kuala Lumpur, some of them in India. 
some of them in the United States. So that's what it does. Secondly, um, our software uh, takes your anonymous uh, internet behavior and tries to suggest products that you use. So all this free stuff you get on the internet, like free email and free whatever and free whatever, is funded by advertising. If you take the advertising away, you'd have to pay for that. So you're looking at one of the guys who was working as a junior programmer on the first commercial email systems in the 1980s. They cost about $10,000 a seat. So would you today spend $10,000 on email? And the answer is no, because you get it for free for Google or, or whoever. So, and the other thing is, instead of you having an ad for dog food displayed to you to fund your free things, and you don't care about dogs, you think dogs are terrible and, you know, your grandmother was bitten by a dog or something like that, so you have this latent, irrational hatred for dogs, you get an ad for uh, the new shoes that you're interested in buying or the, the flights to Frankfurt or something like that. So that's what it does. You're welcome. Thank you.